everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm Katie Early, coordinate our University Express program, and I work for the Erie County Department of Senior Services, and we're here with Caitlin Tucker. Thanks for being here, Caitlin. So we'll quick some quick housekeeping stuff here. We are recording, and if all goes as planned, I'll be able to post this on our website in the near future. Any questions or comments for Caitlin while she's going through her presentation, feel free to put those right in that chat. We're using the chat again today, so it's right where you'll find your Q&A usually at the lower right-hand side of your screen. So type it in as soon as you think about it, and we hope you have fun with us today. We'll quickly thank our sponsors, which is my Department of Senior Services, Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York, Accessory Orthopedics, and Wegmans for all their support. And don't forget, Senior Services is here for you if you need anything or have questions about programs, services, supports, you name it, give us a call. We're at 858 8526. So the star of our show. Caitlin works as an extension aide with the Cornell Vegetable Program, which is a regional extension team that serves vegetable farmers in 14 counties across Western New York. She's very busy. Well, her work is scattered across the region. She's housed in East Aurora, which is right here in Erie County. Caitlin has worked with urban farmers in the city of Buffalo for three years on vegetable production, soil health, food safety, and pest management. As a member of the Greater Buffalo Urban Growers Working Group, she helps to advocate for city policies that can better support urban farmers and community gardens. She co-chairs Cornell University's Urban Agriculture Program Work Team and sits on the NRCS Urban Agriculture Subcommittee. Again, she's very busy. At home, she spends her time gardening, practicing backyard conservation, and working towards her MS in entomology at the University of Kentucky. She's here with us. Caitlin, thank you. I'll turn it over. Great, thank you, Katie. Um, hi, everyone. I can't see you. I'm not as familiar with WebEx, but I trust that you're there and I'm really excited that um, you're here today, that we're all here today in this virtual space, even though it is a sunshiny day outside. Um, but I am thrilled to, to be invited to talk about one of my favorite topics, um, and that is urban agriculture, specifically in the city of Buffalo, which I like to consider not just the city of good neighbors, but good food neighbors. Um, so Katie already gave my introduction. I will breeze over this. As she mentioned, uh, I do work for a regional extension team. We serve 14 counties. We kind of have a, a donut going on here in Western New York. And um, I do a lot of work with uh, food safety, fresh market vegetable production, season extension, and of course, urban agriculture. So um, we're here to talk about urban ag, specifically in the city of Buffalo. So I'm going to highlight some key features of farms in the city, uh, talk about services that urban agriculture is providing to our communities, challenges that they experience, and where you can find uh, further assistance if you or someone you might know is interested in starting uh, their own community garden or farm. And so first I want to define urban agriculture. I, I imagine everyone has a slightly different definition. Um, for me, urban agriculture is all encompassing. It includes not only our commercial urban farms, but those that are nonprofits as well. And it would certainly include school gardens and community gardens, uh, backyard gardens. And for me, it's inclusive of not only those folks that are growing in the soil, but perhaps also folks that are growing hydroponically or in aquaculture. So interest in urban agriculture has exponentially increased over the years and across the US, I mean, across the globe, really. And today you'll find that in almost every major urban area, urban farms and community gardens are popping up as a way to beautify urban spaces, produce food, generate jobs, increase food sovereignty. Uh, and it looks uh, pretty similar across the US. Um, and yet different at the same time. So in New York City, it looks like rooftop farming at the Brooklyn Grange. Um, in Kansas City, it looks like seven acres carved out of the cityscape for immigrant and refugee farmers to 
be able to provide for themselves and their communities. And in Detroit, we have more than 1400 community gardens across the city. And in places like Baltimore, we have industrial spaces being converted into indoor vertical leafy green production. So let's take a look at what urban ag looks like in Buffalo. Um, I want to start first by talking about what the green code, that is the city code allows. Urban ag, wherever you are, is going to be hindered or um, supported by zoning regulations and city policies. And here in Buffalo, the green code recognizes and defines market gardens. So that's great. Uh, it allows for on-site sales, it permits practices like aquaponics and hydroponics, beekeeping, composting. It allows growers to construct infrastructure like greenhouses and high tunnels. And as far as city policy goes, um, the city of Buffalo is off to a great start, but there are a number of additional policies uh, the city could adopt that we'll touch on later. We have I think an impressive number of farms and gardens uh, for a city of our size. So around 15 urban farms, I'm hearing of more pop up, uh, it seems every day, and they are a mix of for-profit and non-profit farms. We have over 100 community gardens. Um, you can see them scattered uh, on the map in the middle there. And combined that equates to around 200 city lots or roughly 25 acres that have been transformed into beautiful productive spaces. Uh, and, and so because I spend most of my time working with urban farms, that's going to be the focus uh, for my presentation. But most of what I have to share is, is applicable to our community gardens as well. So let's talk about some of the features of urban farms in Buffalo. Starting first with what crops do they grow? Um, a to Z, asparagus to zucchini, I've seen just about every crop grown on the urban farms that I visit. Herbs, flowers, they make dried goods, honey, tea blends, um, just it, it's impressive the variety of products that they offer. I think one noticeable uh, or excuse me, one notable difference is that because space is so precious, many of our farmers simply can't invest in crops that take up um, a lot of space for a long time in, in the growing season. So things like winter squash and pumpkins aren't commonly grown on urban farms, at least now, it might change. How are they selling their products uh, all of our farmers sell at local markets across the city. Many of them have their own on-farm market stands that are open various days of the week. They all have CSAs. So these are community supported agriculture programs. Um, and how those work is you sign up for a CSA in advance, you pay in advance so that farmers have the cash that flow that they need at the beginning of the season before they're actually bringing in money. Um, and then usually what happens is every week during the growing season, you will get a bountiful bag or box of in-season produce. Uh, most CSAs run for the duration of the summer, but more farmers are utilizing season extension to be able to bring you winter CSAs. Uh, a few of them also have mobile markets, like the veggie van you see in the top left um, from the Massachusetts Avenue project. And in addition to selling in various ways, uh, they also accept payment in, in, in various ways. Um, many of them recognize that food insecurity is an issue for residents in Buffalo. So they accept SNAP. They are you know, part of the Farmers Market Nutrition Program. They'll accept double up food bucks. They might accept work shares and so on. So how are they growing exactly? Um, 
some of our farmers choose to grow in what I will refer to as native soils. So meaning the soil that was already present when they set up their farm. Now, over time, they are going to have heavily amended these soils with compost and topsoil and mulches um, so that they can support plant uh, health and, and really build up soil over time. On the flip side, some of our farmers choose to grow in raised beds with imported soil. So even when soil tests come back negative for any heavy metals or other contamination, they feel that it's simply best to grow in soil that's been brought in. We also have a lot of container growing. So in, in buckets or in like in bags that you'll see in the top right where there are some potatoes being grown in, um, I believe those are felt bags. And of course we have indoor production. So in the top left, you'll see a photo of basil being grown at Grow Operative, which is a, an aquaponic, indoor aquaponic farm. To the right of that, we have um, an assortment of leafy greens being grown in a hydroponic shipping container setup um, from Ellicottville Greens. And I'm finding that those the shipping container uh, method of growing is becoming more popular across the country. So one thing I love about urban farms um, is that a lot of the practices that they're utilizing are similar to those that are used in rural farms. Um, because at the end of the day, regardless of where they're located, farmers have to manage plant diseases and weeds and insect pests. They have to protect crops from adverse weather. So some of the practices you'll see on farms include um, exclusion netting or row cover in the top left. So these are lightweight fabrics um, that create a slightly warmer microclimate underneath. Uh, and they protect crops from cold weather. So that something like this is great to use early on in the season when we might still experience some frosts or later in the season um, so that we can continue growing our cold crops um, when it gets a little too cold outside. And then of course, it also provides the added benefit of keeping insect pests out. Uh, in the bottom, Left, you'll see a beautiful example of polyculture at the Massachusetts Avenue project. So here we have crops like calendula being planted next to zinnias and next to kale and cabbage. There's okra in the back. Uh, and so planting a diverse set of crops is not only great for the farm's resiliency in case one of those crops uh, succumbs to plant diseases or insect pests, but it's great for soil health. It's great for attracting beneficial insects to the farm and it looks beautiful, right? So in the bottom right corner, you'll see uh, a giant white tarp on the ground. This is at Groundwork Market Garden. Um, the practice of tarping is used to control weeds without having to use chemical sprays or tillage. About, yeah, I think every farm um, prefers to not use uh, harmful pesticides, insecticides. Uh, and so they grow as naturally as possible. Some of them are, are growing organically. Groundwork Market Garden, for example, is um, a certified organic farm. And so this tarp will sit on the ground for months at a time until the farmer, in this case, Mida, uh, Posentides until she's ready to plant into the soil. And then up at the top, you'll see an example of a pheromone trap that is used to monitor different insect pests on the farm so that growers know exactly when these pests show up and in what numbers. Soil health is key on every farm, of course, and on urban farms, we're starting to see the adoption of cover cropping. So cover crops are, are crops that are not grown for cash. They are grown for the ecosystem services that they provide. 
And depending on what cover crop we're talking about, it can support soil fertility. It could add fertility to the soil. It can support soil microbes and all of our soil dwelling insects. Um, it, it can be attractive and supportive to natural enemies, to pollinators. And so here are just a few examples of cover crops grown on urban farms. In the top left, we have sorghum Sudan. Um, bottom left, we have field peas and triticale. So a mix like this, um, with, with a mix like this, growers are not only able to scavenge leftover nitrogen in the soil at the end of the season so that it doesn't um, leave the soil, but they can also add nitrogen to the soil with those field peas, with those legumes that fix nitrogen from the atmosphere into the soil. Hairy vetch is a great example of cover crops being used for weed suppression. You can see just how dense of a mat this vetch is. And uh, in the top right, buckwheat is, is so commonly grown on, on many farms, rural and urban, because it's great for pollinators. And you can see one of our bee friends there is enjoying it. Because a lot of our farmers invest in practices like polyculture and cover cropping, they avoid the use of pesticides. We see a lot of beneficial insects on the farm that are important for pest management. So just a few examples I see across Buffalo, we've got lady beetles or rather Lady beetles are there, but they're lady, the lady beetle larvae are there as well. You can see an example of one in the bottom right corner. Um, numerous wasps, um, including parasitic wasps that um, lay their eggs inside pests like tomato hornworms. Um, in the top middle, you'll see an example of a lacewing egg. Um, it's just on a fine, thin stalk on the bottom of a tomato leaf. And in the left, uh, you'll see an example of aphid midge larvae. So that elongated orange blob uh, will latch onto aphids and paralyze them and suck out their insides. So these are just examples of some of the uh, beneficial insects, natural insect con pest controls that I see on urban farms. And it's thrilling for me to see just how well they are thriving and taking care of pests, even in urban uh, settings. And if you visit any of our farms, you'll likely notice structures like greenhouses, high tunnels, or caterpillar tunnels. These structures are used to extend the growing season and they allow farmers to grow warm season crops either earlier or later into the season um, and similar with cold season crops. You could possibly grow them later into the winter and what these structures mean for us as consumers is that we can buy locally grown tomatoes a bit earlier in the summer or purchase locally grown winter greens in the depths of February when there's three feet of snow on the ground. So moving into how is urban agriculture serving our community? I want to start first by saying that around 73% of our farms are located in neighborhoods under food apartheid. Um, historically, we've referred to this, referred to these neighborhoods as being in areas um, in, in food deserts. But food apartheid is really a more appropriate way to refer um, to what these neighborhoods are experiencing. Um, and, and that is historic limited access to fresh fruits and vegetables. And so if you take a look at this map, neighborhoods in yellow are areas where more than 100 housing units do not have a vehicle. They are low income and they're more than half a mile from the nearest supermarket, which Half a mile doesn't sound like a great distance, but if you don't have a vehicle and you're relying on public transportation, it can be a huge barrier to you in getting access to, to, to fresh produce. And the green stars here represent where urban farms are located across the city. And you'll see that almost all of them are located 
in and around these neighborhoods. And um, as a result, they are providing vital access to fresh produce for these community members. Um, hopefully, we all know that Buffalo is an incredibly diverse city. Uh, almost 10% of our population is foreign born. Um, so, we have a, a great um, immigrant community, refugee community. More than 83 languages are spoken in our public school system. And many of our neighbors might have difficulty finding fresh fruits and vegetables that, you know, they grew up with in their homelands that are culturally important to them, that might be religiously significant to them. And so you'll see on many of our urban farms, they're growing crops for these neighbors. You'll find um, yard long beans and rat tail radishes and amaranth and collards and bitter melon and just about every variety of eggplant um, under the sun. And so it's, it's wonderful that they are keeping all community members in mind when they are um, planning for, for the growing season. Another thing I love about this group of growers is that they're not simply growing food, they're growing community. So at, at the Massachusetts Avenue project, you'll find that they offer youth employment and training in sustainable agriculture, in culinary skills, in marketing, social justice. We have the Green Shoots for New Americans program uh, at Journey's End, which has a refugee farming program that supports either aspiring farmers or folks that come from agricultural backgrounds. Um, it provides them with the knowledge and skills they need to, to know how to grow the crops they know and love in this new, um, possibly drastically different climate. Uh, farms like Wilson Street Urban Farm are leasing plots to community members and providing training to those aspiring growers. Groundwork Market Garden uh, has hosted a number of farm tours over the last season um, and a community plant sale in 2020, our farms came together to donate produce, um, produce bags to more than 35 community members in need. And so these are just a few examples that I think show how invested these farms are in our community. In addition to attracting beneficial insects for pest management, uh, these farms also provide valuable habitat for pollinators like bees, wasps, butterflies. It's not uncommon to see flowers of all shapes and sizes and colors, uh, numerous uh, native species like milkweed and elderberry, echinacea, rudbeckia, um, and many of our farmers are also beekeepers. So in addition to harvesting honey from hives, they also keep bees to help with pollination of certain crops on the farm. Really, there are so many more services I could speak to, helping to reduce stormwater runoff, reducing the heat island effect, job creation, keeping money in our local economy, educating the public on agriculture and food systems. I, I could go on and on. It's, it's truly impressive, all of the work that these farmers are doing for our community. From a research and extension perspective, these farms are valuable partners for us. They provide space for us to conduct on-farm trials. They share feedback on best practices for growing in urban soils. That first hand knowledge is so incredibly valuable. Um, currently, we're partnering with urban farms across Buffalo on, on various projects. So in the top left, um, you'll see an example of exclusion netting on a caterpillar tunnel at Common Roots. So we're looking into how netting like this can keep cucumber beetles out um, and away from cucumbers and squash plants so that they can bring a 
high quality marketable um, product to consumers. In the bottom left, you'll see Allison Dahoney with Urban Fruits and Veggies and a local videographer, Rifat Chaudhry. Uh, together, we're partnering on creating a video series on pest management so that farmers can share their expertise with gardeners, with other aspiring urban farmers. In the top right, um, you'll see a triticale and field pea cover crop. So we're, we're looking at optimal cover crop mixtures. How can you cover crop into raised beds? What species should you plant? Um, how do you incorporate that cover crop in the spring? And um, in the bottom right, you'll see my very simple setup for collecting soil samples for, for bulk density. So we're trying to look at how can farmers, really any urban grower, how can they manage soil pH? I'll touch on, on soil pH later, but how can they bring soil pH down? Um, how are different practices on farms supporting microbial health of urban soils? So I've been working with them on various research projects over the last three years, and I just can't say enough for how much they are benefiting um, just er our knowledge of urban agriculture in general. I've shared a lot of positive, wonderful things about urban ag, but there are challenges. Um, so some of the biggest hurdles that urban growers have to deal with right up there at the top is working with urban soils. They are quite unique. You know, decades of construction activities and demolition and removal of soil and addition of fill has resulted in quite a lot of variability in soil texture. So these soils may also be compacted from all of those activities, which can lead to issues with root development um, and water drainage. Urban soils also tend to have elevated pH. So we, we find not only in Buffalo, but in New York City, and I imagine other urban areas across upstate New York and possibly across the country, um, pH is a little too high. Ideally, we would like to see it between 6.0 and 7.0, because when pH starts to climb, farmers will start to have issues with nutrient availability for crops. Um, and if your pH is too low or too high, that can also impact the availability of heavy metals in the soil for crop uptake, which, which is a concern that I will circle back to probably in a few slides. Um, the next slide, actually, I think. An another characteristic of urban soils is that they tend to be low in organic matter. Um, but many farmers circumvent that by heavily amending with compost, which actually results in quite high levels of organic matter. Normally, you know, we would expect organic matter to be 3% to 5% in many soils. In urban soils, we're seeing anywhere from 10% and up. And that sounds like a good thing, but in some cases, growers might experience nitrogen burn um, or nutrient runoff. And um, while all of these are, are challenges, I think when most people think about issues related to urban soils, they're thinking about contamination. And that is a, a very valid concern. And to be completely transparent, in the US, we don't have health-based standards for lead or other metals and vegetables. So what I mean by that is there's no um, limit on, you can only have 10 parts per million of copper in your beets. And if it's above that, you can't sell it. Um, so, so we don't have any of this guidance that exists in other, in other countries. But the real reason it's hard to come up with these values is that the availability of heavy metals in soils is influenced by everything from the pH of the soil um, to clay content to the moisture content, 
to the type of vegetable we're talking about. You know, are we looking at root crops like beets or turnips, or are we talking about leafy greens or fruit crops? Um, and so it's, it can be unsettling that we don't have that guidance um, across the country. But here in New York State, our Department of Environmental Conservation has established guidance values that are based on um, one, the background levels of heavy metals in rural settings, because yes, you can find these heavy metals in rural settings. Lead especially can be found um, in any soil type across the, the state. And they're also looking at background levels in urban garden soils. And so from there, they established values that are protective of public health in that second column there. Um, and so we can use these values to help provide recommendations for urban farmers about whether they can grow in the native soil or whether they need to do remediation or whether they need to grow in raised beds with imported soil. And this is on growers' minds in Buffalo. Um, they know that consumers may have concerns about food grown in urban soils. And so they came together in 2018 to discuss accountability and transparency of growing practices. And they crafted the Greater Buffalo Urban Growers Soil Pledge. And this outlines a number of best practices that growers can follow to ensure they're doing everything they can to not only protect themselves and their workers, but that the foods they are growing are safe for consumers. And so some of the practices that farmers are pledging to follow include researching the land use history before, before farming, um, testing for heavy metals, um, initially and continuing to test every five years. They are um, training their employees on best practices. They're reducing tillage and they're mulching non-growing areas so that they are reducing any soil dust or backsplash getting into the crop canopy. And so this pledge is meant to be signed annually. Um, if, as a consumer, you want to inspect one of the farms that has signed the pledge uh, to ensure that they're following these practices, you can do so by appointment. So I, I would encourage you to reach out to that individual farm to arrange that. And if you do have a complaint, you can file that with the Food Policy Council. And they have developed a, a framework, I believe, for um, connecting consumers with concerns to farmers and working through those complaints and resolving them. Water access is um, a, a significant issue. I have yet to meet a farmer that can grow crops without water. And you would think that it, it wouldn't be such a concern in the city, but because many farms are established on vacant land, they may or may not have pre-existing access to municipal water. Um, some of the estimates that they have received uh, range from 9,000 to 13,000 to establish a municipal hookup, which is quite a financial barrier for, for many of our farms, especially those that are nonprofits or just getting started. Uh, and currently, some of our, our community gardens uh, are able to use hydrants, um, but there have been hurdles over the years in simply getting the fire department out there to provide the hookup. Um, and of course, it is limited new to nonprofit um, community gardens. And so our for-profit farms have one less option when it comes to getting water for their crops. A major issue for future growers in the city is land access. There are, I mean, this is an issue in rural settings as well, and there are very similar barriers. Um, one big issue is, is simply affording the land. Uh, we, you know, we are talking about much smaller tracts of land in urban settings, but 
Buffalo's poverty rate is hovering right around 30%. The median household income is, I think, about half the national average. And when you add to that, only 40% of Buffalo residents own their own homes compared to, I think it's around 64% on the national level. It becomes pretty apparent that affording land may be out of reach for many residents. And then in addition to simply affording it, land tenancy is, is a concern because if farmers can't afford land, they have to wrestle with how much time and labor and money um, they can invest in a space if they're leasing it, if they don't know if they're going to have it from year to year. Um, location of vacant land is a barrier for a couple of reasons. Um, one, there may not be vacant land in their immediate neighborhood, or two, if it is available, it might not be in a suitable location with regards to industry or development, or they may simply have competition with development. And, you know, going back to, they may not be able to afford it. So, I, you know, there are barriers in acquiring land. One barrier that does not exist, I think, is simply availability. So I want to draw your attention to the photo on the left. This is a map of vacant lots throughout the city as of, I think, 2019. And there are an estimated 17,000 vacant lots of which around 8,000 are owned by the city. So the land is there and there's a real opportunity for Buffalo to be proactive in developing policy um, from zoning to long-term leases to grant programs that can reduce barriers to accessing it. And when you consider that perhaps only some of these lots are going to be suitable for agriculture, it becomes very important that we try to determine which of these spaces should be set aside, not only for urban farming or community gardening, but perhaps parks or food forests or simply green spaces. And related to the issue of land access, you know, it's, I want to mention that it's not just, it's not, excuse me, it's not a race neutral issue. So, Drawing your attention again to the photo on the left, this is a racial dot map. So every dot represents an individual that identifies as a particular race. The blue dots are folks that identify as Caucasian. The orange and red dots, which are predominantly on the west side, are folks that identify as Asian or Hispanic. And the green dots are folks that identify as African American. So if you recall, Going back to that previous slide, looking, taking a moment to look at where all of those vacant lots are located, you'll see that most of them are located on the east side of Buffalo and to a lesser extent, the, the far west side. Um, these neighborhoods, as you can see, are, are not only home to predominantly people of color, but these are neighborhoods that experience high rates of poverty. They have limited access to supermarkets. Um, low home ownership rates and um, limited opportunities for children. So the concern here is that the same neighborhoods that have a surplus of vacant land are the same neighborhoods that have been systematically denied access to this land and to food, you know, to supermarkets. And so we really need to be thinking about, um, you know, moving forward, who is going to buy this land? Who's going to use it? Um, who's going to be driving the urban ag efforts in these neighborhoods? Who's going to be feeding these communities? Whose interests are they going to prioritize? And now I want to move into, you know, next steps. So let's say you or someone you know is interested in establishing a community garden or an urban farm, um, what are some things you should know? What are some organizations you should connect to? So first, I really must encourage you to check out your municipality's zoning restrictions. Um, 
most properties are going to be assigned a zone, either residential, agriculture, industrial, commercial, mixed use. And you may not be able to start up an urban farm or community garden in an industrial zone, for example, due to concerns about environmental contamination. Here in Erie County, we do have access to a GIS parcel map um, that gives you information on how a property might be zoned. So the picture on the right shows a screenshot of the parcel map viewer. So I, I'm looking at a, a portion of the city of Buffalo. I've checked the zone layer and you'll see that properties are assigned a different color that corresponds to the legend on the right, which gives you information on how the property is zoned. And then going into the code, you can see what is or isn't allowed in those particular zones. And, you know, I, I mentioned code, so you'll want to check with your municipality's ordinances as well. Um, there may be restrictions. You might have to have a special permit for urban farming or market gardening. Uh, there may be restrictions on the number of chickens or beehives you can have. Maybe they don't allow chickens at all. Um, you may not be able to conduct on-site sales. Maybe there are going to be requirements that you, uh, you have to grow in raised beds and you can't grow in native soils due to concerns about um, contamination. So check, check the code, check zoning, and from there, I would encourage you to start, you know, dreaming up what you want to do and, and other things that you might need. And I'll share a workshop that I'm giving later that, that goes into more of those details. But um, I want to talk about funding opportunities real quick. As interest has increased over the years um, in urban ag, so have funding opportunities. As recent as 2018, urban agriculture was formally you know, officially recognized by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And the Office of Agriculture, Urban Agriculture was formed. And that, that was huge because what that meant is now we have a lot of money for urban agriculture education and research, um, numerous grant opportunities related to community growing, composting, research, as I mentioned, um, funding to put up high tunnels in urban spaces. And many of these grant opportunities are, are not only open to for-profit farms, they might be specific to nonprofits. Um, many of them are open to municipalities. And um, with NRCS funding in particular, so that's the Natural Resource Conservation Service, they are targeting funding for urban ag in in these priority areas. So this map on the right in orange are the urban ag priority areas, but they've also added a lighter yellow orange buffer to capture any farms or community gardens that might sit just outside urban spaces. And you can see here that most of Erie County, I would say probably half of Erie County is eligible. So reach out if you want to learn more about these funding opportunities. I'm happy to help direct you to which opportunity might be best for funding your project. I want to talk briefly about urban ag policy. So it, it's important that all of our municipalities adopt urban ag friendly policies. Um, I'd encourage you to take a look at the local food action plan. This was recently released by the Food Policy Council of Buffalo and Erie County, and it outlines a number of recommendations related to food and agriculture in general across Erie County, but um, it also has some recommendations specific to urban ag. So some examples um, include protecting farmland, so ensuring that these spaces that have been stewarded for years by farmers, by community gardeners, are protected for future generations. Um, we want to enhance procurement of culturally appropriate foods, perhaps into our school systems. 
Um, they're recommending that we support incubator farm training programs that we elevate youth education and workforce development and urban agriculture. Uh, you know, the Food Policy Council is really interested in your feedback. You can visit their website to fill out a survey. I know that they would really appreciate it. And so, okay, so organizations that you might connect with. I, I'm, of course, going to mention Cornell Cooperative Extension. Um, Starting first with CCE Erie, uh, the office is a great resource if you are interested, particularly in community gardening, in master gardening programs, if you're looking to find farmland in rural or urban areas. Um, educators at CCE Erie are part of the Regional Farmland Navigator Program. This is with American Farmland Trust. And the purpose of the program is to connect people that want land with people that are are phasing out of farming that want to ensure that that land continues um, to be in farmland uh, in the future. And then the office, of course, can provide assistance on marketing and business development. Now, if you want, I should say, if you have an urban farm, that's where the Cornell Vegetable Program can step in. That's where I can step in to help. If you have questions around vegetable production, soil health, pests, food safety, please don't hesitate to reach out. And then I'll also mention that CCE Niagara, just north of us, has a beginning farmer training program. So if you're interested in learning about the basics of running a farm, so business planning, marketing, planting, wash pack, all of that fun stuff, uh, I would encourage you to check out their website and, and the details of their program. I believe a few people from Buffalo actually participated in the program this past year. We are very lucky to have the Food Systems Planning and Healthy Communities Lab here in Buffalo. Um, that's at the University of Buffalo and led by Dr. Samina Raja. So Samina and her lab do just incredible work with food policy and food systems in general. And they've recently acquired funding for a project titled Growing Food Policy from the Ground Up. And they are, quote, uh, focused on people-centered, equitable food policy in Buffalo that centers black and brown experiences. So if you or someone you know is an East Side resident, they are specifically looking for feedback and direction from you. You can visit this QR code. You can contact Carol Ramos. I can bring this information back up at the end if you, if you do want to um, share your feedback. So I mentioned the Food Policy Council a couple of times now. I should probably give a formal introduction. Um, so back in 2009, a need for a Food Policy Council um, was identified. So to the, and the purpose being to direct and encourage sustainable, just food policy across Erie County. Food Policy Councils are popping up in urban areas across New York State. I believe Rochester has just now identified the need for a food policy council and is starting to get one up and running. Um, we are fortunate enough here in Erie County to have had one um, formally recognized by the city since 2013. And so they have been hard at work drafting that local food action plan that I mentioned. If you're interested in this type of work, they are accepting new members, um, but you need to apply by November 5th. GBUG is another group I've mentioned. So the, the Greater Buffalo Urban Growers Soil Pledge is, is where you heard that reference. And GBUG is a working group that has existed in various forms over the years. We are a group of urban farmers, community gardeners, food policy council members, representatives from CCE that are focused on promoting urban agriculture. So we put together tours for public officials or just the public in general. We help to identify policy needs that we can then take to the Food Policy Council. We have been drafting 
resources for consumers so that they can make informed decisions on, um, on purchasing food for their families. And if you would like to join us in our efforts, I have our email address down there at the bottom. Our meetings have been on pause for the summer while our farmers are hard at work, but we hope to resume um, now that it's getting colder. And I think we might have had our first frost last night, so maybe we'll be meeting soon. And just a few more organizations, Grassroots Gardens of Western New York. I mentioned we have more than 100 community gardens across Buffalo. Grassroots Gardens has taken the lead on supporting those community gardens. Um, and they have been since I think the early 1990s. So they help to facilitate land access, hydrant access if you need it. They have a number of resources available in multiple languages uh, related to integrated pest management, building raised beds, seed starting. And I can share wonderful news um, that they've recently become an accredited community garden land trust. So they are very truly devoted to protecting these spaces um, for future gardeners in the city. And if you are interested in joining a community, or excuse me, starting a community garden, um, either in Buffalo or Niagara Falls, uh, their applications are due November 30th. I think one last organization I want to share with you is the Buffalo Freedom Gardeners. This was founded in 2020 by Miss Gail Wells, um, a longtime community gardener, uh, I believe master gardener and activist. So Gail had a really strong desire to help residents in Buffalo that were most impacted by COVID-19 and, and food insecurity. And so through her leadership and direction, the Buffalo Freedom Gardens project has been able to donate raised beds um, or container gardener, gardens, uh, seeds and supplies to freedom gardeners across the city. So I, I'm not sure what the plans are for 2022, uh, but if you're interested in volunteering, I believe they're having a harvest celebration this weekend. Uh, if you might be interested in receiving a freedom garden, you can visit their Facebook page or send them an email. So as I wrap up, not sure how I'm doing on time, but as I wrap up, I want to share that I will be presenting on how to find land in the city at the 2022 Northeast Organic Farming Association or NOFA uh, conference. So this conference is going to be in a virtual format again this year. And there are tracks specific to urban farming, gardening, and homesteading. So I'll be presenting on everything you need to consider when you're looking for land to farm on in the city, zoning, land use history, infrastructure, community considerations. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I don't just mention this so that you can come to my talk, but we also have a couple of other urban farmers from the city of Buffalo that are also presenting on topics. So Groundwork Market Garden, Five Loaves Farm, and the Massachusetts Avenue Project uh, are, are regulars at the NOFA conference now because there's such experts in urban farming and community development. And so you might consider joining us in January for this conference. And if you can't join us for that, then maybe you can join us for the second part of this workshop. So um, you've had an overview now of urban ag in Buffalo. Part two of this workshop will be a panel with um, a select number of organizations from the city. So we'll be joined by Grassroots Gardens, Urban Fruits and Veggies, uh, the Food Policy Council, and Five Loaves Urban Farm. And I'm hoping we can learn more about their organization, how they, get, how they got started, what drives them, how you can support them. Um, that's November 10th from 1030 to 1130, I believe. Katie, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but I, I hope you can join us for that. And with that, I just wanna thank you all for tuning in. Um, this is something I love to talk about. And if you wanna talk more, please reach out. Here's my contact information. Um, 
And I think with that, if there are any questions in the chat, I'd be happy to take those. And I'll leave, I'll, I'll leave my contact information here. Just, yeah. So you said we have several questions? We do, but first Great. we have at least one person calling in, Caitlin. So do you want to read your email and your phone number just so they can capture that, please? Absolutely. So my phone number is 573-544-4783. It is an unusual phone number. I'm from Missouri. So that's why you see a 573 area code. Um, haven't changed to 716 yet. And then my email address is cv275 at cornell.edu. Thank you. And Missouri's mm -hmm. fun. My in-laws have family in Vandalia. So I just oh. to toss it out there. Great. Um, okay. Well, thanks, Caitlin. Let's get started with these questions. So this first one is, where can you get information about CSAs and what's available? So I, I think a, a great first step would be to um, identify an urban farm that you might like um, to, you know, you might like joining their CSA and then they'll have information about their CSA on their own website, um, details about the products that they're offering, the dates that the CSA runs. Most farms will announce um, CSA memberships in late winter. And I, I wanna say that there are a couple of websites, I believe Local Harvest, is is a spot where many farmers um, sort of advertise their CSA programs, but I wouldn't assume that all of our urban farmers are on that website. Erie, uh, the Erie County Department of Agriculture has a new program called Erie Grown, and this is um, a website where you can find more information about all farms in Erie County and they have a map. So if you specifically want to identify a CSA in the city, you can zoom in on that map and, and find one of, the, um, one of the urban farms and that will link you to their website and their contact information. So I, yeah, I would start there. Okay, thank you. This next question is for the cover crops like hairy vetch, do they just stay there for the off season or for good? That's a great question. Um, it depends on, on what the farmer is hoping to get out of the cover crop. And so some farmers, especially urban farmers, because they are growing on small spaces and they're trying to maximize production, they can only squeeze a cover crop in into the late fall or winter. And when you're planting that late, you have few options as to what, you know, for what you can grow. Hairy vetch, field peas, triticale are all great winter cover crops. Some of them will winter kill. That means as soon as it freezes, they're gonna die, but that, that biomass can sit on top of the soil surface and minimize erosion. Something like hairy vetch is actually winter hardy, so it will live, it will go dormant over the winter, but it will come back in the spring. And um, depending on whether they're growing it in the field or in a high tunnel, if they're killing it with tarp or if they're, they're tilling it, um, it could become weedy if it's allowed to grow, if it's allowed to go to seed. Um, so, I'm now I'm forgetting what the initial question was, <laughs> but um, all, all that to say that some cover crops are meant for the summer, some are meant for the fall, some will become weedy if they're not managed, some will winter kill. Uh, I love cover cropping, and that's a big part of what I do is cover crop research. So if you want to talk about which cover crops might work for your garden or your farm, absolutely reach out and we can nerd out together. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, I know we're coming up on time here and, and you've got to go. Do you have a time for a couple more questions? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. So this one is um, more on contaminants, which I know we covered, but 
there might be some more here for you. Mm -hmm. So in regards to native soil gardening, tested for heavy metals, but what about other contaminants that may occur where a home has stood? Yep, that's a really good question too. Um, absolutely, there is a chance that other contaminants could exist. Um, I'm trying to think of the acronyms, polycyclic, aromatic hydrocarbons, um, volatiles are less you know, likely to be in the ground, but there could also be physical contaminants too, right? Um, so absolutely a concern. And the best way to test for those additional contaminants is to do an environmental site assessment. And different laboratories offer these services. I believe we have a couple in Buffalo. They're going to be a little bit expensive. Um, I don't know pricing off the top of my head, but you know, a heavy metals test might run you 40, 30 to $50. Um, an environmental site assessment is, is probably going to be at least 500, possibly 1,000, depending on how many tests you uh, or excuse, how many contaminants you want tested for and how many samples you're submitting. Um, yeah, I, I wish I could um, think of the, the labs that offer those services. You might just consider Googling like environmental site assessment and I'm sure a couple of local labs will pop up from there and then you can view the individual tests that they offer on their website or give them a call and I'm sure they'll let you know. Thank you for that. This next is a two-parter. It starts off with, thanks for organizing this interesting and informative program. I checked national websites like the nationalgleaningproject.org um, and foodforward.org and cannot find any registered gleaning programs in the Buffalo area. Do you know of any local gleaning organizations where I might volunteer my time? And no, I did not make that up. Someone did put that in there. <laughs> <laughs> I love this question because I love gleaning. And I think we need to do a lot more of it. Um, I do not know of any gleaning programs in Erie County yet, but the Food Policy Council has recently expressed interest in creating a gleaning program. And so I would reach out to them, maybe you might consider joining, but I would reach out to them and maybe you can be part of the conversation on how that gleaning program uh, comes together and, um, I, I actually, I'm thinking now Rust Belt Harvest. I don't know if this organization is still in existence. They started prior to the pandemic and you know, pandemic was difficult on many organizations, but I believe they were intended to be a gleaning program um, focused on like fruit trees um, across the city. So that's Rust Belt Harvest and Food Policy Council. I would connect with them if you're interested. Okay, so thanks, Caitlin. And then the, the second part to that question, and then I'm not seeing anything else. So this is, are there programs for residences to donate compost to gardens? Mm -hmm. So donating compost to gardens. I don't know of a program like that, but the Farmer Pirates compost um, so the farmer pirates are, are a collective of urban, or cooperative really, of urban farms here in Buffalo. And they have a, sp a spinoff organization called Farmer Pirates Compost. So they have been collecting compost from residences, I believe just in Buffalo. And so you might connect with them if you have compost that you want to donate. They have a composting site in Buffalo and they in turn, you know, they manage that, they screen it, and then they offer that product for sale to, um, to gardens. So uh, Farmer Pirates Compost, Ignacio Villa, I believe is the, the one in charge there. Cool. Well, Caitlin, thank you so much for taking time and talking with us about this exciting topic. It's really neat to hear about all of the good work that's going on and all of the people that are involved. So we appreciate you and thank you to everyone who's on. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you back on November 10th at 1030. Great. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure.